Lewis. <laughs> no more of these gaseous emissions that you're so well known for. <laughs> Boom! And we're live. All right, you want that tweet action? Cheerio to Torquil Dewar. Mark T's here. Woohoo! And uh, virtually no one else. We we <laughs> <laughs> we scared everyone off. We've got like two people waiting. Um, let's go ahead and get this tweet going though. That's going to change things. That's going to bring because them we're in. We're not going late today. People expect that actually us might to be it. Be like fifteen minutes late. Yeah, we're early for once. Uh, although we're still late. We're we're less late than we normally are. How about that? Okay. There's the tweet action. I only have one character left. That's going to bring him in. Oh, shoot. I forgot to change the screen art. Well, too late now. Nothing we can do, Lewis. <laughs> Got to just roll with the punches here. And it won't matter anyway because this show is going to be so good and jam-packed full of useful information that that in and of itself is going to bring them in. Don't you think? Oh, it's always all about the content, right? It's, content is it's gonna bring them in king and or queen. See the content? <laughs> Let's hope it's not all about the content. Maybe more just about the personalities, right? The blending of personalities. Uh, yeah, I don't know what's going on. I don't have any of my metrics up. Everything's broken. Nothing's working. We got Darth Inkling here, though. He says, let's go. We got Lane Gandy. We got Yanto 3000. Sounds like a samurai name, doesn't it? Yanto 3000? Sounds like, I wish I could read like your me. tweet here. Well, what what do you need a different prescription for your those Coke just, bottle glasses like, you got? If you you hit the hit the quote tweet thing and then it it's like shows only you know a third of what you wrote. So oh, okay. Now look, we want lots of participation in the chat today. Um <clears throat> our the favorite comments today will get flown to San Francisco and get to spend an entire week living with Lewis Wallace at his house. <laughs> That'd be fun for everyone involved. <laughs> you get, you, it'll be like a, it'll be like an internship. You get to, is, is that really a, an award? That's... <laughs> Shh. Quiet, 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 you. <laughs> Thinly disguised punishment. <laughs> You'll get to participate in your favorite Cult of Mac activities, getting coffee, Rubbing Lander's feet till he falls asleep, helping herd writers and catch the escapees. There's all sorts of stuff that you'll learn. Okay, well, look, let's go ahead. Oh, yeah, click that like button while you're coming in. Please, please. We desperately need it so badly. And help us hack the YouTube al algorithm so those people suffering through another four-hour episode of the talk show, we'll see that there's, there's another option. <laughs> Actually, he, the group doesn't ever do a show live. I guess, yeah. unless it's at WWDC. Yeah. So it won't matter anyway, but please still do it. Uh, thank you, Darth. <laughs> May the Schwartz be with you. Um, let's go ahead and cue up Mrs. D, and we'll get this thing rolling. I feel like I'm missing something. I guess we'll find out. Oh, Mrs. D. <laughs> Steve. Oh, my dear. Did somebody say Schwartz? <laughs> Mrs. D. <laughs> Don't take that any further, please. Because I was going to say, I saw LK Schwartz last night. <laughs> oh, great. Louis. Freeze? No, I don't think so. Oh, that was weird. I think Miss D almost froze me in horror, though. <laughs> I didn't even hear it. Oh, oh, really? You look so good. for a second there. Okay, well, hopefully everyone else heard Andy. it. Uh, <laughs> oh, man. Let's go ahead and get this thing rolling before Mrs. D talks anymore about the dark side of the Schwartz. None of us want to hear that, Mrs. D. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. We know that the Schwartz are... Never mind. Okay. Uh, let's get this thing rolling with some music. And we got a lot of stories to cover here in three, two. Hello! And welcome to Cast, the best 30 plus minute of conversation you're going to hear all week long. I'm your host, Aaron Elijah. Join me today. Authorities suspect... 
suspect several missing Cultimac writers are stashed in the grounds, the walls, the concrete structures of his San Francisco residence. But so far, no evidence has been found. <laughs> He's the managing editor of Cultimac. Louis Wallace is here. Can I comment on the ongoing investigation? Yeah, I know. Also with us, I hear he went full primal during Monday's solar eclipse, dancing, playing the bongos and nothing but a self-made loin cloth, repeatedly chanting, all right, all right, all right, for eight straight minutes of the totality. He's a writer, Cultimac Griffin Jones is here. Good evening. Airfot, I actually have a different question for you this week. Okay. Have you received your Fujifilm X106 yet? Oh, dude. You're going to just make me mad. No, I haven't received it yet. Uh, <laughs> this is unbelievable. I mean, I ordered that thing. Uh, I had my order complete 90 seconds after they went live at B&H. And I don't know if Fujifilm is just getting so hit with orders that they can't possibly catch up. But did I order it 90 seconds after it, after it released? How do I still not have this camera? It's unbelievable. Have you been charged? No, they haven't charged me yet. Um, I mean, they can't charge you until it ships, so there is that. But, dude, it's like, how, how is this possible? I, I don't understand. And they keep sending me emails saying that Fujifilm has not been communicating how many units are going to be available, and they don't know when they're going to be replenished, and so on and so forth. But... I don't know. I I, I got to call them and see what the heck is going on. Like, I'm really unhappy with the situation. It's been Can two you order months. order from somebody else? Or is uh, it just sold out everywhere? It's sold out absolutely everywhere. And then Fuji opened up orders in Japan, and then they shut down orders because they got so many. Uh, this was the same problem with the previous version of the X106, the X100V, and it was just sold out for years. Like, no one could get it. And... We thought that this, that this, that was going to be changed with this new camera because Fujifilm changed um, their manufacturing location or their manufacturer so that they could double capacity. <laughs> Made absolutely no difference. We're in the exact same situation again where no cameras are shipping. I don't know what you got to do to get one of these cameras. I mean, I, I, I ordered it 90 seconds after it released. I ordered it. I, st I still don't have it. It's unbelievable. Uh, let's see here. Better be one heck of a camera. Yeah, no kidding. I it better be like one of the best pieces of technology ever made. I actually am very much looking forward to it, but I I don't know when that will actually be that I get my hands on it. Um, let's see here. We got a great show for you all today. Oh man, the M4 Max with AI uh, with AI power engine. <laughs> I hope that's what they call it because I literally just made that up. <laughs> AI power engine. The yeah. AI power engine. Is <clears throat> it's right around the corner. Griffin and I, Griffin was just making fun of me last week or the week <laughs> before because I was saying that I thought the new Max might come this year with the M4, and that was just speculation purely based off my um, my sharp wit and te technological analytical skill and prowess. And looky here, look who agrees with me, the Germinator himself. <laughs> So we'll talk all about that. If you've been thinking about buying a MacBook Pro, don't. Because these are the machines that we've been waiting for. And they may even come this year. German says they might come this year. Which is crazy. So we'll talk more about that. Um, we have to talk about Apple's next big thing, or lack thereof. They are, <laughs> I think, grasping at straws here. Trying to figure out what they could do next that's going to have the same impact as an iPhone, an iPad one of their other big devices. I don't know what they have coming up, but it doesn't look good. Uh, Griffin's going to talk about opening up uh, the App Store to retro game emulators, which Apple just did. And then something about Ferret UI, helping AI use your iPhone. I don't even know what that means. So we'll see. I, I have a hunch you didn't read the show notes. <laughs> uh, I didn't read this one specifically. I saw Nor this one and I was like, pass. Research paper. I didn't read the white paper. Um, Lewis is going to tell us about how terrible this new human... Is it humane? <laughs> AI pin 
is? That is correct. Dude, we saw this coming from 100 miles away. Like when I saw this thing, I was like, that is either vaporware or it is definitely not going to live up to the height. There's no way that it could. I mean, look at it. It doesn't look yeah. like it does anything useful. And it just came out and it's not great. It's not great. We'll talk about that. We're going to wrap up with an all new what we're into, where, which we haven't done in forever. The segment where we talk about things that we are technically into um, or things that we're into, but don't actually revolve usually around tech. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Shout out to Betty Reyes, who just joined us. Level remixes here. Oh, good. Finally, the party started. Before we dive in, a couple of just really quick things. Um, we just released an all new cult cast off topic, which is our new show that's ad free and free for all. Thanks for those of you who are supporting us at support.thecultcast.com. Uh, we're doing a series called Versus, where we <clears throat> have a battle of the movies where we pit one movie against an another one uh, and keep doing that to see which movies end up uh, ranked best on our top 100 and top 20 and top 50. Movie list, super fun segment. We just released episode two. This week, we are going to be releasing uh, an episode that we did on theme parks. I don't really know how else to frame that, Griffin. Like, We just basically argued about what we like about theme parks and what's going wrong with Disneyland. <laughs> which, yeah, yeah, which which yeah. I thought was like, you know, the, the, the whole content of the topic. But then we got to the end of that and you're like, and we're only just starting. We're only so, just begun. You know, stay tuned for that. It took us like 10 minutes just to get warned up. So, and then we started getting into all the good stuff. And I was like, well, we're 30 minutes in and this is only supposed to be a 15 minute episode. So we had to stop. But um, if you're interested <laughs> in theme parks, even if you're not, I think it's a fun episode because we, we talk about the, the modern, the state of, of the modern theme parks, what's going on with Universal, what's going on with Disney especially the Disney stuff. There's just so much drama happening with Disney as a company that we generally don't talk about on this show. And um, right towards the end, Griffin and I started arguing about um, the state of modern Disney content. And I was like, Ooh, this is good, but we got to stop. So come back next episode. So the, the URL to contribute uh, torque is uh, support dot the cult cast.com. I should change that. To, well, I don't want to, put any other URLs out there in case people get confused support.thecultcast.com and if you want to um, control or manage your uh, subscription it is a subscription by the way every month you're going to be forking it over every month you can go to unfork.thecultcast.com I'm just making that clear because people have been pinging me to ask about it um, and if you have any issues managing your subscription or can't get into the cult club just ping me airfun.thecultcast.com I'll help you out Personally, I will personally help you out. Uh, let's see here. And then also, just real quick. Oh, mama. You guys know that I love those factor meals. <sighs> they are so delicious, so tasty. Do I have them up on the screen? Yeah. Griffin's shaking his head yes. Because I, wish I had one right now. Oh, dude, I'm all out. I am all out. But if you like having restaurant-quality food in your fridge at all times, just waiting for you. You just go heat it up. Then you, you definitely need to give Factor a try. Uh, Factor, eat stress-free this spring with Factor's delicious ready-to-eat meals. Every fresh, never-frozen meal is chef-crafted and ready to eat in just two minutes. Choose from a weekly menu of 35 options, including popular options like Keto and Protein Plus. Protein Plus is, the, is my favorite so far. Just a big old slab of meat with vegetables. Everything's covered in like a delicious sauce. You can heat them up quick. They're always juicy and delicious because they're never frozen. And, um, man, it, it, they're just – everyone is so unique, and their recipes are so good. Um, I love having them for lunch. They won't put you to sleep. Like They'll actually give you energy for your workouts, which I like. Um, any any commentary on the, the quality of the meals there, Griffin? All, Since I think at this point you're, been, you're caught up with me. Excellent. None of them have disappointed me so far. And I will also say that it's – like really the best thing about it is that it takes all of the stress out of having lunch in the middle of a work day. Like yeah. I used to work in an office and I drove home to have lunch, but then I was like, well, uh, I've got to prepare something and cook and eat it all within like the 40 minutes that I'm home before I get back into the <laughs> office. And, you know, you just pop one of those factor meals in the microwave. It's, it's ready like two and a half minutes later and then you eat it. And then like the next five minutes, and then, you know, you can just kick your feet back for the rest of your lunch break and, you know, 
be relaxed instead of like haphazardly tossing something together on the stove. It's it's really good. Uh, it's really fast. I'd almost say it's it's better than having leftovers in your fridge because leftovers from like Applebee's or like a restaurant, they aren't designed to be microwaved. That's true. You know, you're going to reheat that steak and it's going to be chewy and bad. You heat up a factor meal, every one of them has been fantastic. Like just today for lunch, I had this like chicken and like, you know, some kind of red sauce and the chicken just like pulled apart. I didn't even yeah. need a fork. I just like pulled it apart Dang with it. a spoon and it was just wonderful. You got, you still got some left? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, oh, mama. Yeah, well, we could continue. Um, if you haven't tried them out yet, I, I would say definitely give it a shot. Head to factormeals.com slash cultcast50 and use code cultcast50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next box. That's code cultcast50 at factormeals.com slash cultcast50. And that's the word cultcast and then 50 cultcast50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next box. While your subscription is active, thanks to you, Factor, for supporting this episode. Let's dive right in. Lewis, I'm sending it right to you. Hot off the press. Yeah, breaking a, news. A this fresh... is almost like breaking news. I mean, I, I, I mean, it is breaking. Like it came out like an hour ago. This. Barely had time to read it before the show started. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so Max with AI-focused M4 chip launching this year is the headline on Cult of Mac. Uh Oddly enough, this comes from Mark Gurman, reporter at Bloomberg. Uh, he says that uh, <laughs> Apple is currently preparing multiple versions of the M4 for the full range of Macs, and the first ones of them are going to come later this year. Uh, this is a quote from the story, and this is bizarre. The M4 chip line includes an entry-level version dubbed Donan. Does that kind of like defeat the purpose of a code name? I mean, what does that even mean, Donut? Can somebody? That's the, that's the whole point. It's a code name. Usually it's something that you can understand. Anyway, I'm getting distracted. <laughs> <laughs> Entry level <laughs> version of Donan, more yep. powerful models named Brava, okay. and a top end processor code named Hydra. I like that one. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, those make sense. Brava, Hydra, Donan. It's a. It's, it's a weird word. Anyway, the company is planning to highlight the AI processing capabilities of the components and how they'll integrate with the next version of Mac OS, which will be announced in June at Apple's annual developer conference. Let's see here. So, uh, blah, blah, blah. Previous report from a separate source already said uh, M the M4 is going to get an upgraded neural engine. That's a section of the chip dedicated to running AI tasks locally. It handles things like voice recognition, offline Siri already, you know. So you know how good it is. Offline Siri. Wow, baby. <laughs> if you uh, liked online Siri, you're going to love <laughs> offline Siri. Uh, so uh, here's kind of the, the, the roadmap for releasing these things. End of 24 and beginning of 2025. Uh, all across the whole line, these all these Macs are going to get uh, M4 chips. Um he says that the Donan chip, that's the uh, low-end one, is coming to entry-level MacBook Pro, new MacBook Airs, and a low-end version of the Mac Mini, while the Brava chips will run the high-end MacBook Pros and a pricier version of the Mac Mini. Mac Studio, Apple is testing versions with both a still unreleased M3 era chip and a variation of the M4 Brava processor. And uh, the highest-end Apple laptop, the Mac, I'm sorry, desktop, the Mac Pro is set to get the new Hydra chip. Uh, he points out that's the lowest selling model in the company's lineup, but has a vocal fan base and uh, people have complained that maybe it doesn't have the greatest processor. So this is supposedly going to be, you know, the super duper, what was it called? Hydra, Hydra, the Hydra chip. Watch out, baby, Hydra. Uh, I, I think what I don't see here is the uh, exact time frame. It didn't seem to make it into our show notes. I yeah, believe it uh, it's a little it, bit higher up. Um, oh, I end of 2024 it. and beginning of 2025 will bring new iMacs, low-end 14-inch MacBook Pro, high-end 14 and 16-inch MacBook Pros, and Mac Minis, all with uh, M4. Okay. The MacBook Air will get the next-generation processor in the beginning of next year, and the Mac Studio will come in that summer, and the Mac Pro in that fall. Oh, there you go. How did I skip right over that part? <clears throat> well, we were wondering that same thing, Louis. <laughs> <laughs> That's really like the, the next year and a half that we have charted out here. The interesting thing to me is that um, if the Hydra chip, like it's pretty easy to map most of these to the existing lineup. Like Donan is probably just base M4. The Brava chip is probably the M4 Pro. 
the Hydra chip, it says that's only coming to the Mac Pro. Right now, the Mac Pro doesn't have its own chip. It shares the the Ultra with the Mac Studio. So could that mean that M4 is getting the uh, extreme level chip that we that we speculated it could get? Yeah, I was just going to say, we talked about this last week. For those of you that, that uh, missed it, is there there was speculation, there has been speculation that they're changing the the architecture of the Ultra so that it becomes like its very own distinct chip and not just a blend of M2 or the M Max chips. So that very well could be. What I also thought was interesting here was um, that, uh, let's see here, uh, 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 that, he, that they said that they're playing around with the M3 and M4 variants for Mac Studio. Did you, did you say that, Lewis? And I'm I like, did, do believe that I did say that. I, I do believe that you did. And, and if that is the case, well, if we're moving towards M4 by the end of the year, then there's no way they're going to put an M3 in the Mac Studio. It's going to have to be an M4. They're going to probably have to skip that generation and just go right to the next generation. And what I find to be so interesting about this story is, I mean, first of all, it's surprising because of the pace of the updates coming here. So I'm looking at the Mac Rumors buying guide. And the average uh, release cycle for a MacBook Pro is 390 days. So over a year, we're 164 days since the um, the last updates, were, which were October 2023. I dare say, I think we're going to get the M4 MacBook Pros uh, instead of every year and a half-ish. I think we're going to see these in October before the end of the year. I mean, if Mac sales are becoming sluggish, that works, that works in our benefit because that means that TC can't just rest on his laurels. I, I wonder if TC has ever rest, rested on his laurels in any capacity. He gets up at like 3 a.m. to go to the gym, right? But that means that Apple is not going to be able to rest on their laurels and just keep selling us uh, the same M-series MacBook Pros or Macs. They're going to have to do something to build some excitement, which could mean that M4 is coming in October, which if I had bought an M3 max macbook pro <laughs> for four thousand dollars that would be slightly disappointing because it just means that your machine isn't going to be as current as um as as long as it otherwise would be but dude if you're if you've been waiting for a macbook pro like i have i have been toying around with the idea griffin asked me weekly if i purchased a macbook pro uh now i'm definitely not going to buy a macbook pro well maybe i don't want to say definitely i'll say like 95 percent I'm not going to buy one now because we could have them like during the holiday season and the M4 chips are going to probably, well, obviously be more performant than the M3. Um, And I would guess like even the M4 pro is going to be more performant than the M3 max in, in many of the benchmarks. So this is, this is super exciting that we might be getting a more aggressive release cycle. Anything that I missed there, Griffin or Lewis. Aside from I, you, I, I for a moment, like he popped right out. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I mean, geez, you know, if the reason they're doing this is because Macs are selling slowly, well, then they're not very happy that this news came out because, man, they're really not going to sell now. Who would buy one now? Just months away from the next one. Come on. Well, I mean, that's the way it seems, right? But but for normies, they don't know this. They, they, don't, they, don't, know they, don't, they don't know what's going on. I mean, only those of us that care enough about <clears throat> what's happening in the ecosystem the Apple ecosystem enough to a make a podcast, b listen to a podcast. Um, <laughs> oh, I think I thought I thought. Uh, look at Griffin. Look at Griffin. <laughs> I I, well, I this thought is a pretty I, boring topic, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> Those of you listening, he looks like uh, he looks like oh he's gone. His head was frozen in a downward position, and it looked like he was taking a nap. And I was like, is Griffin sleeping? Was the uh, there he is? He's back. It's like an ep- episode of Loki where he just keeps popping in and out of time. <laughs> <laughs> that, Look, that he's back. My internet connectivity. Yeah, you were you were heads down, eyes closed, like uh, <laughs> a congressman during a uh, <laughs> during some uh, long uh, session or something, and then all of a sudden, hearing on how to. Uh, a hearing on how to, you know, constrain Apple. Yeah. And uh, I thought you were asleep for a brief moment. I was like, I think Griffin actually fell asleep because you were frozen like the perfect <laughs> position. But, uh, and then I realized you were frozen. You, you All know, right, the, well, let's uh, hope that is not The one thing that we should point out is yeah. that uh, this is based on anonymous sources. And Griffin does say, Apple's plans might change. 
But uh, I don't know. I found this pretty surprising that this just came out this early and that they would come out with this this early. But of course, this comes like, like a day after Microsoft gets all this buzz over their AI PCs, right? And it's, yeah, it's a little bit suspicious timing. Yeah, and I don't know what to make of AI PCs. I mean, Apple clearly is trying to capitalize off the trend and is going to be using AI buzzwords and everything. And it's hard to know if this will be something that's actually useful or if they're just doing it. It's like calling it, was it the uh, A12 Bionic? Was it the A12 Bionic where they added the Bionic? I mean, dude, talk about it in the Now it's Bionic! Wow! And uh, yeah, I, uh, Phil Schiller literally said the only reason they added that word is because it, it did well in focus groups and people thought it sounded good. So they added the bionic on there so that it would sell well. And I was like, this could be one of those scenarios. Yeah. I, I'm very curious what uh, all these AI features are going to be. I mean, when they started talking about it, I was like, geez, what are they, they going to do it? I still I still really don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't I don't understand how beneficial it's going to be. but I don't either. I wonder if Apple does too. <laughs> uh, hey, real quick, we got... Four ninety nine super chat from Mark T. We got to read this one, and he's he's got a point here. The bright light shining on Lewis uh, is like he's either going to going to Haven or outer space. I'm guessing he means heaven. Well, we know you definitely like to not... think so. I like to think so. <laughs> you do look very angelic today, Lewis. You know, did you set up a spotlight mentioned... or something above you? Because uh, just uh, you know what it is, I could turn that light down. Oh, I don't think you should. I forgot. <laughs> I think you should turn yeah. it up. Does it go any higher? <laughs> I'll turn it up to 11. If I turn it up to 11, I'll have skin cancer by the end of the episode. You look like you're about to get a sunburn from that thing. <laughs> it looks like a spotlight. Shine. But it's it's a lot brighter than it used to be. You know, this is really a tangent. but I, Or I maybe was, your forehead's just shiny. I was cleaning I was cleaning my uh, uh, light switches the other day, and I thought I broke the one that controls this. But what I did was I, I had accidentally slid the slider up to 12, you know, all the way off. And then I turned it back, and then I just turned it naturally all the way back up. Maybe it was set like halfway. Maybe that's oh, why it looks different. Okay, so you were cleaning the light switches as one does, and you may have accidentally well, repositioned it. No, I didn't reposition it. The, the I, brightness thing set on your Mac <clears throat> camera setting as well. The brightness thing on my Mac. What's well, let's what's not let's different? definitely not play with that right now. That sounds like something we should definitely not touch. Yeah, the studio light setting. The the show. Uh, <laughs> studio light. All right, look. Well, let yeah, me put a let me better. put a bow on this. I like the studio. <laughs> uh, so that all being said, if you've been thinking about buying a Mac, the M4 generation is is incoming. Like we're talking about before the end of the year. So definitely hold on to your butts and your wallets, and um, let's see what Apple does here because we could be in for a earlier than expected upgrade cycle. What a Merry Christmas present that would be. Okay, let's continue on because we don't want to be doing this show until. Um, 10 or 12 p.m. tonight. Until the, until the chips come out. <laughs> Which, at this point, is uh, where, what we're on target for. Of course, I've lost track of my notes. <laughs> and I have absolutely no idea where we are. Uh, I think it's going please. to me next. Nope. Come on. Oh, yes. you're right. You're right! Am wow, I ever not? Once again, this... you're right. <laughs> I don't know why you, why you doubt that, but... So, I did want to at least mention this. There was a story out this week... Um. This was Apple Insider, I believe, but I, I placed it somewhere else. Yeah, where did I put it? Definitely not in the right spot. What has Apple got next for us? Did I put the oh did I put the wrong um I put the wrong story in there. I put the wrong URL. Oh in there. dear That's heavens. what's wrong. I had that open earlier. Okay, hold on everyone. <laughs> I'm not even embarrassed. Um This was also a a, a uh a Bloomberg story as well. Um, in fact, this probably was a Bloomberg story. Yep. Guy, I got that all messed up. Apple is rebooting its search for its next new big thing. This is, uh, I think, a definitely an interesting topic. What is Apple going to have that's going to replace the iPhone? They were hoping it was going to be the Vision Pro. And actually, I think in the next five years, that could be a significant product category for them. But I think we knew going into the Vision Pro, just from the lack of enthusiasm that was displayed heading up to it, that it probably was not going to be this huge hit because it's kind of a tough sell. It's a new product category. You wear it on your face. And 
it's not like a watch, right? Everyone gets a watch, but something that you wear on your on your face and you can carry on a battery pack, like that's that's a little bit more um, arcane, I think. And now Apple has shuttered their Apple Car project, and the Vision Pro isn't ending up being a big hit. <clears throat> what is next? I'm going to this Bloomberg article now from the Germinator. Just one year ago, Apple's pipeline of future products looked chock full. The Vision Pro had yet to be introduced. Smart home devices were in the works, and the Apple electric car finally felt like it was starting to get real. Today, the story is a lot different. The Vision Pro is now in store shelves. It's clearly not a mainstream hit. The Apple ve vehicle project canceled along with an effort to make next generation smartwatch screens. I think they're talking about the uh, micro LED, which was also either pared back or canceled. The performance gains of processors have begun to plateau and the company remains a laggard in the smart home market. Dang. Laggard. Holding no, pulling no punches. His source, Tim Cook, is probably not happy about this article. Don't you think, Lewis? <laughs> um, uh. To make matters worse, Apple rivals like Microsoft and Alphabet have leaped forward in generative AI, much to the excitement of consumers and investors. Meanwhile, Apple has largely sat on the sidelines. Apple's business remains heavily reliant on the iPhone, which accounts for more than half of its revenue. That's something that we don't talk about nearly often enough. And sales in that market have stagnated. That's made it all the more important for the company to find a major new product category. Apple has been in this situation. Here's the bright spot. Bright spot. Apple has been in this situation before. Don't forget that the iMac got the company back on track in the late 90s. The iPod vaulted it into consumer electronics during the early aughts, aka the 2000s. Then there was the iPhone, which churned Apple into the juggernaut it is today. But during the most recent holiday season, Apple got four-fifths of its revenue. Four-fifths from iPhone, Mac, iPad, Apple Watch, and AirPods. Of course, the iPhone accounting for most of that. So even its online services are not going to necessarily be as big of a category as some might be, um, even though they're still ramping up like Apple TV Plus and the Apple One um, bundle, which I think is kind of a ripoff. But I just don't know what Apple's going to do next. I really don't know what product category they could venture into at this point. I think generative AI could be something that would bring them additional revenue, but it's going to be like Apple TV Plus. You know, like Apple is not Microsoft. They're not going to be the foundational structure of all the generative AI um, cloud processing and cloud storage. Like I think Apple actually uses Microsoft services. And then there's Amazon also on the forefront. And then there's Google also on the forefront of... of web compute, web storage, and Apple's not. So I don't really think that the... It, Apple needs to be. It's not part of Apple's business to be that sort of lowest common denominator, like provider of infrastructure. That's exactly my point. Is So like the AI stuff that they do is never going to be a huge money-making venture for them because I think in order to make money, you have to be, you have to be the infrastructure that everyone uses, which is Amazon, Microsoft, and Google's approach. So I don't really know what their next product category could be that's going to be a slam dunk like there's not any area of the market aside from cars that are so ubiquitous that apple could dive in and take a huge chunk of it and start making a bunch of money like the phone was so obvious everyone wanted an apple phone we had been talking about it for years before they actually made it and the phone the smartphone um, ecosystem was so bad remember like the wap internet like using web versions of like the internet or uh, text versions of the internet was so bad. There was obviously a lot of room to improve things, but I don't even know what industry Apple could go into next and make better and create a new okay. product. Do you guys have any ideas? I, I can't even my think question, of one. My question is, why do you think Apple needs something big next? Because, okay, it's been literally... It's been literally two months since their last major product introduction. And I guess my question is, so what? So they don't have a, they're not making a car. That was a stupid idea to begin with. So what? They're not uh, I just know, with you there, trying man. to be the Amazon, you know, S3 of, of AI. Yeah, because they're trying to focus on the consumer facing features that ordinary people actually care about. I don't like what's, what's, 
what's the matter with their existing product lineup? People are happy with them. The company isn't going to sink because they're not perpetually chasing like a, a another thing to be the iPhone. There was the they, because they already have the iPhone. Well, the problem here, Griffin, is this. This is their stock price over the last year. Let's take a look over the last five years. I think they're they're up a lot in the last five years. The problem is this: is eventually you stagnate and you start you stop making your revenue projections and you're not growing from a financial perspective anymore, and that affects your stock price because people start to look at you as um, no longer a market leader in the tech space, and your stock price stops starts dropping. And when that starts happening, investors start getting pissed. And they start going to the company. Like, this is exactly what's happening with Disney. And I don't know if anyone has been following Disney news, but there was there is this, this investor named Nelson Peltz who has been aggregating shares from major Disney stockholders trying to ga- gain influence over Disney and get a seat on the board. In fact, he was seeking two seats. And he's been doing this for like years now. This is an ongoing effort. And and his position is like, you guys are mismanaging your company. You are not making any money from your movies anymore. You've totally lost your way. You need someone to come in here and help you figure out what the heck you're going to be doing and how you're going to survive into the next 10 years. Because, you know, what's that old adage? You know, going broke happens slowly, then it happens fast. It's like it takes a long time and it's a a long lead time to destruction and then it happens really fast you know and so apple is not going to disappear obviously in the next 10 years but they have to be focused on like what are we going to do for our next phase of growth our next phase our next big product like how are we going to continue growing as a company and even i think your point is valid like they're already so successful they're not going to be gone anytime soon that's true but they also don't want to be in like a blockbuster video position or a (laughs) toys r us position where they sit on their laurels and they do nothing and they milk a product that has been around forever and then all of a sudden they realize there's another company that has come by and done something that you should have thought of. And I think probably a better example would be BlackBerry. Black, You don't want to become the next BlackBerry where you're like, well, what's wrong? Like We're the global uh, phone uh, brand that everyone loves. And as soon as the iPhone came up, BlackBerry went out of business. Actually, I think they're still around, but obviously not in the same capacity. So Apple has to figure out their next big thing. And I don't even know what that next category would be. I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on the matter, but I I do think it's, this was an interesting admission. It's like, okay, we tried a Vision Pro. That wasn't going to be the slam dunk that we were maybe hoping for. So what is that next thing going to be? And that leads us to like the home robot story that we were talking about last week where that wacky story where it's like Apple's going to be making home robots. I think I saw German say that they were considering making a robot arm that held a display on it that would like move around and follow you as you like walked around. So it's like uh, center stage <laughs> on steroids, right? It's like this like robotic arm is like following around with a screen, like a snake uh, looking at you as you walk around your house. I don't think robotics is going to be it either. I don't think AI is going to be it for them. So I don't know. There's some definitely some interest in the going Disney exactly how they in the Disney it. stuff. They said it was going to be they said it was going to be a low volume product at first for the first year, and it yeah. it turns out it is. And they actually they were actually able to produce, you know, more than they thought they were going to be in the first year. And it's it's a long term bet, you know, that it's going to be expensive at first, but then it'll they'll come out with future versions of it. Like I don't I don't I don't think it's 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 fair to say that the Vision Pro is a disappointment when it's only two months into its product life and it's going exactly how all of us thought it was going to go. Okay, look, I, I want to be totally clear. I don't think it's a disappointment either. In fact, I think it's going to be a great product and, and it's it's a, it's a it's a V0 product, right? So it's exactly what they were going for and I think it's kind of exactly what we expected. So I definitely don't want people to think that I think it's... it's um, I'm not trying to be a doomer here. I don't think the Vision Pro is doomed <laughs> at all. Like I, I And I, I try to be careful to say, like I think in five years, it's going to actually probably be ubiquitous. It's going to be really super cool. Not there yet. And the price obviously is uh, you know very high, and a lot of people aren't going to be willing to spend the money. Although we got Gurn from the chat saying that they want a Vision Pro so bad. Okay. I mean, the Vision Pro is cool. How often are you still using yours, Griffin? You still got it. 
Oh yeah, like not every day, but you know, several at least several times a week. Okay. I've I've had a pretty pretty busy week the, this past week. Did you wear it to the solar eclipse? <laughs> you know what? I really regret not taking a spatial video of the of the totality. Yeah. That I didn't I didn't have that idea until like the next day when I saw somebody on Mastodon asking if if anybody did. I was like I should have done that. God that would have it. been a good idea, especially to capture. It's hard because you want to be looking at the sun, but it. I, I think one of my favorite parts of the solar eclipse that I went to in 2017 was the primal energy that was radiating from that crowd and people just like, you know, dancing and banging on drums and stuff and howling and all sorts of crazy stuff. Like in the spatial video, that would have been really cool. I don't know if you could have captured the actual eclipse in spatial video because it's so far away. I don't know if it would have made it feel like three-dimensional. But the people, that would have been pretty cool. We should do a cult cast off topic of your uh, solar eclipse debrief because I want to hear about how it went for you. We haven't even talked about it at all. So maybe we should save it for when we do that off topic episode. Of course, I also you know, want to do an off topic. I don't have as much to say because about it. You know, okay. it, was, it was pretty neat. Um, it, it wasn't the. Wasn't you heard the, it here, folks. First, folks. Spiritual yeah. wasn't the exper- spiritual experience that it sounds like you had. Uh, really? Two things uh. stood out to me. One, it was very unusual seeing it get darker outside. Yeah. Without the shadows getting longer, like the shadows stayed exactly where they were. Obviously, the sun hasn't set, but it was still getting darker, and that was a very weird experience. Also, for like the three minutes during totality, all the streetlights came on. Oh, fun. no way. That kind of ruined it. Yeah. Well, it, I don't know. I thought it was... And, and you also hear, like, all the crickets and the frogs, like, start to chirp up. You know, because, you know, it's semi-rural Ohio. All all the crickets start chirping in, like, the middle of the day. And then as soon as the sun comes back out, they all quiet down again. <laughs> I wonder why they only make those noises at night. Or just in darkness. It's weird. What's up yeah. with frogs and crickets? What's What's <laughs> the deal with frogs? Yeah. <laughs> I think it's just the way they're programmed, man. Like my rabbits that I have, I have rabbits. Um, for those of you that don't know, I have like these big, juicy, succulent New Zealand meat rabbits. These things are so juicy and delicious. You, you've never seen rabbits this big. They're probably bigger than your dog. And they are definitely nocturnally programmed. You know, like I'll, I'll barely see them during the day. And then I come out and their beady little eyes are just staring at me through the, through, through the thick of the night, you know? Oh, my God. They love being out at night. They stay out all night. And they just sit on top of like their rabbit cage, looking at things. Oh, that just my dogs are seventy-five of... and eighty-five pounds, so they're definitely not bigger than my dog. Oh, they're, I, they're I getting close though. Big what was that, Lewis? Uh, just, just that that rabbit story just reminded me of uh, one time. This was probably I don't know twenty years ago or something. Twenty-five years ago, some friends and I drove down to uh, Austin for South by Southwest, and. And we, you know, we were camping all throughout the, the Southwest, right? So we, we pulled into this place in Texas and we pulled into this campground. And I swear to God, there were like hundreds of these giant jackrabbits. They were all like, you could see their eyes and they were all standing up, you know, in the car lights, you could see them. It was the creepiest thing I've ever seen. They were, they were like, you know, <laughs> half as tall as me too. They were, it was, it was like, Whoa! It, it honestly made you feel like, good God, do we should we camp here or should we just keep moving? It's like the beginning <laughs> of a horror story, right? Yeah. Oh my God! It was uncanny as could be. I I, I never saw anything like it. No oh, PTSD, man. You just triggered me. Well, if you would have <laughs> seen these rabbits too, because these these rabbits that I have, they're not like the wild rabbits that you see that are skin and bones. Like these things are big and juicy, and they'll look right at you, you know, and they'll get close to you too. They're not afraid of people. Although I guess a lot of rabbits actually are. Are they, the are they carnivorous? Them, yeah. Makes it sound like you've eaten some of them. No, but I've thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> I like, can tell. If, if I mean, <laughs> when we got these things, my wife told me that they were New Zealand meat rabbits, and I didn't even know what that meant because it's a rabbit. Like you know, I've had rabbit before, and they're pretty um, sinewy, and they are not very succulent creatures. You know. And then these things, after about a year and a half, I was like, "Whoa!" Like, I have this one. <laughs> I have this one rabbit. Her, oh name's, her, her name's Flower. She's got like this pouch that just sits under her face. It is like, it is like out to here. For those of you listening, it's like three or four inches 
under. It's like the ultimate double chin. It sticks out like th- four or five inches, maybe. And I'm like, look, look at that, that thing. I bet you, oh, I bet you that thing is just so juicy and delicious. Like, have you cooked that thing? I can see why they use these things as meat rabbits in New Zealand. I don't know if they do, or if that's just the name of the breed. But they get so succulent, and all you got to feed them is like grass and stuff. It looks like a just a walking ribeye, a rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, <man>. <laughs> <laughs> that may be the wrong way to, oh, to describe that thing, but you know, like a rabbit ribeye, you know. I I have never heard anybody describe their pets as succulent. Oh man, I sh- I should post a picture of these things. You ha- you have never seen meaty, juicy, delicious rabbits like this in your entire life. They're huge. Are you and sure you haven't eaten one? No, but I'm thinking about it, and, and I threaten them often, just like I do with my chickens. I'm like, you better start laying eggs, because if I don't have eggs, I'm coming after you. <laughs> and they're like, Bark! Send me a picture of the rabbits, and I'll make it the chapter artwork. And then when people see, wait, why is this story from Bloomberg about Apple's future have chapter artwork of a giant rabbit? Okay, I'm going to do that. I'm, I'm going to go. Oh, yeah, they're sitting. I, I, so I'm, I'm looking down from Colt Command. My window is like right in front of me. I can literally see that big, juicy, delicious pouch from here. She's probably 40 yards away from me through the fence. Wow. And I can just, it's just sitting there just getting, you know, juicier by the moment as she sits there chewing like all the alfalfa sprouts and stuff that we give her. Oh, yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. This, is, this is a, took a dark turn. <laughs> all right, look, where are we? I don't even know. Uh, we've been live for like three and a half hours. <clears throat> we haven't even made it through. Uh, well, the Mac, the, the M4 MacBook Pro just got released, so we should probably just talk <laughs> about that. Um, Okay, I'm going to pass it to you, Griffin. Let's do the um, the App Store emulator story. We, we're so far behind here. Um, I don't even know if we have time for all the rest of this stuff. So let's do that story. Let's skip ahead to um, the Humane AI pin review. And then let's just jump jump straight into what we're into because we, 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 we can't be here all day. Actually, I'll actually talk about the ferret thing. because I think Okay, that, whatever you want to do, yeah. That That's fine. We're talking about AI today. This is a pretty big uh, indicator of what Apple's working on in the AI space. Apple's Ferret UI helps AI use your phone. Uh, This is a multimodal language model that could help artificial intelligence systems understand your iPhone screen, according to a new research paper Apple released Tuesday. So this has the potential to give Siri like all kinds of new superpowers. It could be a, a game changer for people using these devices with low vision, and it could also help app developers uh, doing user interface testing. So Apple put out a research paper titled Ferret UI, Grounded Mobile UI Understanding with Multimodal LLMs. Sounds like a real page turner. The idea behind this research paper is that they've trained a large language model to look at your phone uh, and identify like, you know, this is the tab bar, this is a menu, this is a disclosure arrow, this is the title bar. You know, it's like an LLM that's been trained on Apple's human interface guidelines. The researchers said Ferret showed, quote, outstanding comprehension of UI screens and could act on them. And researchers uh, benchmarking showed Ferret did better than, quote, most open source UL MLLMs and also beat GPT-4V on elementary UI tasks. So, you know, they're really ahead of the curve on this sort of thing. Um, so the research paper doesn't go into too much depth about uh, how these features might be applied. You know, this is obviously just a research paper. Apple doesn't really talk about features before they're announced. But given how it works, and given the rumors on how iOS 18 will be the year of AI on the iPhone, it's uh, it gives us a lot to speculate on. Like right now, right now a lot of why Siri isn't very good is because Siri needs to be like specifically programmed to do everything that you ask it to do in advance. Like there's an there's an API called like the Intense Framework that gives developers uh, like the ability to add Siri features inside their app so that you know when you ask Siri to do something inside Overcast or inside Spotify, Siri will be able to interpret the answer. But if Siri can directly use your phone, and that, that can be really powerful. You might be able to like give it a command, have an LLM interpret what you're asking for and then hand it off to Ferret UI to tap around and do what you asked on your behalf. And I think that could be pretty, pretty neat. What, that what could, could, that could be like the general purpose <laughs> voice assistant that we've been asking for. I feel like we're being talked to by Max Headroom. You remember that guy, yeah, Lewis? It's a little, it's a little oh, creepy. Yeah, I Griffin, love the way 
you slow down and then <laughs> speed up a lot. Your internet <laughs> is 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 uh is dying, man. I don't know what's going on up there. Is your backup going or something? Yeah, my, my backup recording is going. Uh, oh no no no, yeah. not your I'll, recording. I'll I I mean like your actual computer backup. Like, <laughs> are you backing up the Backblaze or something? No. I quit. Exit the time machine. Exit the time machine. You, and and like I need to adjust your camera because like right now it's set to adjust with your resolution changes and I think Skype is like buffering your resolution so your your picture just keeps going like boop up beep boop boop it's jumping all around. <laughs> So we probably caught like eighty five percent of what you said. I think we we caught the the major beats, but um, you were going all Mister Roboto for about about sixty percent of that. Um, so you said you were having internet issues this week. Like, have you tried turning it off and on again? Your uh, cable modem. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. My my internet router has been incredibly unreliable this past week. Oh, uh, weird. I'm actually going off of my iPhone tethering right now. Oh, is that why? Oh, okay. Yeah, because we lost you in the cast as well. Just FYI. Soon you'll run out of uh, your unlimited bandwidth for the for the month. <laughs> your unlimited <laughs> bandwidth for the month. Your unlimited bandwidth. Yeah, for this, the, this, the there's a backup solution I could do for exactly one cult cast. <laughs> All right, well let's um let's keep it moving then, so we can get you um off the internet here. Um, let's see here. Lewis, you want to hop into this humane AI pin review? This is ultra hyped. We've been seeing this thing. The marketing has been so buttery smooth. I mean, it looked like it was something out of um, the movie Her with Joaquin Phoenix. I don't know if any of you saw that movie where he carried around like the virtual assistant in his pocket um, and had a camera pointing out of his pocket so like, the AI could see what was going on around him. And then it became so lifelike that he developed a relationship with it. Um, that was kind of like the premise of the, of, of the movie. Um, and then Humane if you hadn't heard of it, it was like this really cool um, orange, let's see here. Oh, this is a different one, isn't it? Yeah, I think, this, you're, thinking, I think you're talking about the rabbit, right? Yes, I was thinking about the rabbit. So this is a, another version of the same product, I'm, I'm guessing. This is, uh, so this is the AI pen from a company called Humane. Uh, it looks a little bit like one of those comm badges from Star Trek, you know? Yep. So it, it pins, well, it actually, I guess it doesn't pin to your shirt. It there's like a magnet that goes on the back behind your shirt or vest or whatever and holds it in place. That's a little thing. I, I heard it described as about the size of a, uh, like the camera module on the iPhone 15 Pro. Yeah. That kind of thing. So that's, and supposedly, you know, super beautifully designed, really high quality. Like, multi, I've, I've read a couple of reviews that just, I guess, the embargo lifted day or something. And they, they, they're basically saying, hey, this is like Apple quality device right and it's not too big of a surprise it's it's a company that's headed by uh at least three uh ex apple people or he, i guess it's headed by two ex apple people and it's got a bunch of people on the staff anyway this this device has been it's an ai blah blah everything ai it's it's an ai gadget that has been kind of described as like an iphone killer right that was one of their early things they they Oh, it's going to make the iPhone that, obsolete, right? Ca calling it an iPhone killer is an indication that it is in no way, shape, or form actually going to kill an iPhone. <laughs> yeah, well, so, uh, you know, it does have some interesting features. It's got, like, a little laser, tiny little laser projector, and you, like, hold your hand out, and it puts a little user interface on your hand, and you, you know, and and it's, it's for so-called ambient computing, which is actually a great idea, right? Like, that's you saying something to Siri and, and Siri responding and giving you the, the right answer that you want, right? It, it's it's having a computer with you at all times that works and does the things you need it to do and helps you do things, get, you know, a, a, a constantly with you tool. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's we, we've written about this thing several times, you know, and Griffin wrote an article about how it's going to be a disaster. It sounds like he was absolutely right anyway. So <laughs> these first first reviews come out and uh the, the, the verges the verges headline is humane ai pen review not even close <laughs> uh <clears throat> let's see let's let's read some choice snippets from the verge so uh this guy says after, after many days of testing the one and only thing i can truly rely on the ai pen to do is tell me the time i mean so i'm not watch yeah <laughs> he says it's it's warm not painfully hot but warm as in uh 
it says it, it feels like Humane decided early on that the iPin couldn't have a screen no matter what and did a bunch of product and interface gymnastics when a tiny touchscreen would have handled all of these things much better. Hmm. Uh, in general, I would say that for every successful interaction with the AI pen, I've had three or four unsuccessful ones. Sounds a lot like Siri, actually. And half the time, seriously, at least half, I don't even get an answer. The system just waits and waits and fails. Uh, and he, one of the things that's supposed to be, you know, like it's one of its main uses, right, is it, it can translate things, you know, which is exciting, right? Like if you, you can imagine going to a foreign country and, and you don't speak the language at all. You got this little device on you, and it, it lets you talk to people in real time. So <laughs> this is another amazing thing. Rather than translate things, it would just say them back to her in a horrible and occasionally almost mocking accent. <laughs> well, now I kind of want one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, the other big review that that, uh, that I was reading this morning was, it was by... Um, it was on inverse, and this was written by Raymond Wong, and and he had a lot of the same problems. Like his the whole beginning of his review is like how it didn't work and th nothing would work at all. Uh, then he says he 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 went he like t went to take it back and get another one, and and like a full reboot fixed these problems. Huh. So it made me wonder if the Verge like just needed to reboot the device, right? The the one the one thing you ever do, force reset, right? Anyway, so but this this review is also really, you know. Not good. Um, oh, it's catastrophic. Yeah, I, I mean, mean the, and, and if yeah, this so, if this was the if the if the origin of these issues was that they just need to reboot it, I mean that would be a huge <clears throat> black mark on the Verge's record. I can't imagine that would be it. I mean, but it also makes me think if this thing was so unready for release, why would they send it to the Verge to review? That makes zero sense. I mean, do you not think that the editors of the Verge are going to realize that your product doesn't work in the first 10 minutes of using I, it? I mean, this is the whole problem with AI, right? Everything with AI, it's like um, capable of amazing things. Uh, this is what this guy says uh, at uh, writing for uh, Inverse. So sometimes surprisingly good results, right? And other times just complete and utter garbage. Like not even close to the truth, not even close to, uh, you know, accurate, right? Um, let's see, one of the things that... that he says also is it, it, this is i thought this was kind of telling speed is essential for ai powered experiences to resonate with consumers and that's also the ai pin's biggest compromise at launch the ai pin's whole cosmos operating system and ai stack comprised of the voice-based ai assistant and the laser ink display projector is slow to answer even basic questions so it's slow and he's saying like uh you know compared to alexa google assistant and yes even siri Getting an answer to certain basic questions like "What's the weather?" using the AI pen can take as long as six seconds. May not seem like that long a wait, but when other AI assistants can answer almost immediately, AI pen feels like a turtle crawling while the hairs race by, leaving a trail of dust. A lot, a lot of rabbit talk in today's podcast. Oddly enough, um, that is interesting, isn't it? Yeah, and and he also said, you know, really bad at photos and video, and he has comparison shots of like video, of images that he took with the thing versus taken with an iPhone, and. It's, a bad hardware and B this thing's on your chest right so you can't really maybe tell what it's what it's looking like right oh yeah uh, and and so and he actually he went through a long thing about how, how tall he is and how like maybe if you're taller it would be it'd take better pictures I don't know if that even makes any sense but is this is a, it's a really interesting review um and and one of the things that he mentioned is is this he, he went through a, a a thing where he said okay I want you to describe what's in front of me right so like maybe for a blind person right tell me what what's in front of me and so and he, he shows a picture of what was sitting in front of him and it it got a whole lot of details right you know it says a, a you know human being sitting there with a, a black or a, a red and white and black plaid shirt uh a table with a, a paper in front of him mac behind him all this stuff. but then it's like oh but there were certain things like there was no black in his shirt there was no, there was only one chair instead of two, and, and that's bad enough, right? Like it's, it's that's close, but not no cigar, right? But then he also said the same thing, like at his house, like, hey, what, what's in front of me? And like he's got a cat and you know his window and whatever, and the thing says, oh, it's a cat that looks looks like it's pregnant. There's, you know, went into all this detail, and this is oh, and outside there's uh, you know, these trees with you know wind, gusty clouds, and this and that, and uh, he's like, my my window 
there's a window there, but the blinds are completely closed. Oh. There's, 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 and, and, and so he asked it, he said, Hey, how can you tell me what's out my window when my you know blinds are closed? And it went into more detail about what was outside <laughs> his window. I mean, that sounds like AI. Yeah. It's so that's the problem with AI. You cannot trust it for anything. It's yeah. the results can be amazing one second and absolutely like worse than useless a second later because it's, it, it sounds good, but it's completely wrong. So how, that, that's why I am so skeptical about this giant rush to AI and AI and everything and AI, AI, AI you know, it's such a buzzword. And it's like, come on, man. I, I, I mean, it's it's just not ready for prime time. Maybe a year from now it will be. But that and, and that's actually what this guy says about that pin, the AI pin by you made, just to get back to it. He he basically wraps up by saying, you know, it's a work in progress and that uh, I'll just read another little quote here. I could see glimpses of the more ambient computing reality humane is trying to create, a lifestyle that lets you be more present instead of having your nose buried in a bright display. Okay, that sounds great. He also says the AI pin right now is unlikely to replace most people's smartphones. It works more like a companion to your phone that makes you use the apps less or a second brain to collect your thoughts and preferences over time. But similar to how Apple Watch didn't get good until Series 3, if Humane can make some big improvements by the second or third generation, I think this AI-powered wearable that hangs off your shirt could have a future. No way. So It's not going to huh? happen. I this, don't know, this, man. This thing's I, DOA, man. I mean, this whole <laughs> premise is ridiculous. Like... This would be like th- there are certain there are there are certain tools and interactions that are just so perfect for humans they they're not going to go away, and the idea that we're gonna re- we're gonna re- re- remove screens from things because you know talking through how you want to interact with a machine is a better experience I just think it's so ridiculous. Like just imagine going to a restaurant and instead of looking at a menu you had a person read you the whole menu. Like how much longer does that take? And not only that, but you forget things as you hear them. Like viewing interactions, viewing information is so much more efficient. So that's why I think that this idea is never going to be anything more than a fringe novelty that some people end up using because, I mean, for, for one reason, people like to see things. Like we have eyeballs and we like using our eyeballs because it's fast and it's efficient. And more than that, uh, I until AI has gotten to a point where it is able to expertly understand human context and um, and uh, speech inaccuracies, like when you're talking out loud, you don't necessarily say what you want to say or express yourself the way you want to express yourself. It's easier to do that, I think, like via typing or pointing and clicking. And so it would also have to be able to understand what your intent is, what your meaning might be, and then take action on that. And then I'll give you a third one for free. There is the <laughs> ecosystem. There, There is the digital ecosystem that we all exist in, right? It's like a product like this has to take your speech and interact with other systems in a way that they were des- not designed to be interacted with. Like, the internet exists, it's visual, you point to things, you click on things, you search with text. This has to take anything that you say and interact with all those systems that were um, not designed to work the way it wants to work and somehow affect the thing that you were trying to do, like order you a pizza or call you an Uber. And anything beyond very simple tasks, I think it's just not going to be able to do because our digital ecosystem is not meant to interact that way. So I just don't think that this is ever going to be anything more than novelty. And if it and, and if it does go anywhere, it's going to be ten to fifteen years and, before and, and yet, that happens. And, and yet you think that the Vision Pro is going to be a, a massive success. Well, the Vision Pro is an uh, evolution you, of what we already do. This is a completely different paradigm, I think. I to me, I this think thing the, the humane. Oh, sorry, go uh, ahead. Yeah, that's all right. Go ahead. You, you appear to have that, a solid connection, so run with it. I think that the humane AI pin is to the iPhone what Quibi was to Netflix. Like, this is trying to solve a problem that ordinary people don't have. It's trying to solve a problem that, like, what high-level Silicon Valley executives have. Like, they use their phone as, like, a, uh, I have a, you know, their their interaction with the iPhone is, like, uh, I need a way to triage all of the things that happen in my life. And, you know, my phone is a distraction from all of the things that I do every day. Whereas ordinary people 
like the phone is what they want to use. You know, like right. people people don't want to use their ordinary people use their phone to fill in the spaces that they that they don't otherwise have filled in their daily lives, like while you're cooking dinner or you know while you're just relaxing after a long day of work. And like that's not what that's people don't want people don't want that removed from their lives. That's the point. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I I mean I I don't think that it be, could. I think the thinking of it as an iPhone replacement is is the mistake. I think that uh, ambient computing is is kind of cool. You know, like if you could, for instance, uh, ha- have a thing on your thing, and you say, "Hey, read me the last line of that of that recipe again while you're cooking," and you don't have to like. I mean, how many times have you picked up your phone and right, and it's like, oh my god, you, turn, you scroll back through fifty million <laughs> ads, giant nightmare, impossible to, sometimes to cook a, a recipe using your phone if you're on the wrong website, right? But if you could ask that thing, hey, do this, or you know, it, it just as you know, Siri on a HomePod could be really useful if, in fact, it wasn't so ridiculously bad at times. It, it, this is that same problem. It's like getting the the device to do the thing that you wanted to do is awesome. Think about Star Trek's you know, computer, right? Like, hey, uh, you know, give me the answer to this, and it's the right answer, you know, and you can like. <laughs> you know base your life on it right as opposed to like what's outside my window and it and it tells you and it has no idea and it's it says it in a completely starts making stuff completely up. confident way right yeah i mean the hallucination part of it is is terrifying to me uh the ambient computing aspect of it i think is is interesting and and could be really cool i mean it's kind of like uh using siri on the apple watch right i mean you can ask certain things and certain things happen and and when you say hey uh unlock my front door and it actually does it seamlessly quickly then it's like wow that's awesome but the next time you try it and it takes 10 seconds or it just finally says sorry your lock isn't responding and you go well it's just not there yet so i don't know i i thought that that i think the ai pin because it's a small thing that's with you and could keep you from digging out your phone hey i'm sorry what what street do i turn right on again if if you could get to the point where you could do those things it could be good i mean yeah, well, I, not an iphone pin- replacement but good. AI pin as it exists today is like they're trying to sell you Siri as a hardware product, and it would be entirely made obsolete in iOS 18 when Apple rolls out a smarter version of Siri. Like the story that we just talked about immediately before this. If if Siri could do all of those things for you, then you don't need an AI pin at all. Well, you do if you have to like. I mean, it, it's it's just like an easy, always-on way to trigger it, right? Uh, I mean, even the watch is, you know, you lift your arm and whatever. Yeah. Um, it, it's it would be like having a HomePod right around with you, right? I mean, and in, in the, you can see how in certain ways that could be really handy, you know. Uh, but the other thing about this, and I think this is just the exact same problem that the the Vision Pro has, is. I don't think society right now is ready for people to walk around talking to themselves. I mean, we already see it's already weird enough people walking around talking to their phones. And then they're, now they're walking around just staring into the sky, sky and talking to their, you know, it's, <laughs> every city in America will look like San Francisco on a bad day. I was going to say, I, you don't often see people walking around talking to themselves. I'm like, you should come to Seattle, but I guess you already know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you it know, happens a lot here. It, it, it's, it's weird. I mean, like you think about like the, you know, a sci-fi movie, right? And and they have an advice like this. I mean, I guess it makes sense. I mean, you get maybe you get to the point where it's it's completely it's societally acceptable. Right now, it's it's a little bit of a tough a tough push, you know, just like seeing people walking around with a Vision Pro, which is you know ridiculous. But it, I, I mean, I, I I have not yet. No, that's not true. I I was around Leander when he had a Vision Pro on, and it's weird being in the same room with somebody wearing freaking goggles like that i mean it's just <laughs> it's you just can't get over it it's weird yeah they need to improve the user experience for those who are interacting with the person wearing the vision pro i agree but i do think that they'll, they'll dial that out and unlike this product i think the vision pro actually i think there are a lot of valid use cases for it um because it's, it's like a a more personalized version of an ipad that you just wear on your head at all times which iPads are a thing that people understand like this. I don't know. It, it just feels like you're getting rid of like the best part of the iPhone and forcing people to use the worst part of it. You know, there are some people yeah. that say that it could be good for, for blind people. Yeah. I totally agree. Accessibility. Yeah. I, I think that, that user experience 
or that use case actually does make a lot of sense. Like to make didn't something that could lie to you about what was actually in front of you. Then right. Sure. Right. Well, <laughs> I should, we should caveat that with that happens with all AI. So that right. hallucinations, as you said, Lewis, are a problem with all generative AI, at least currently. And hallucinations being that for some reason, the generative AI will just make stuff up um, and give you answers that are just plain not true, but they seem true. And so and they seem the believable. They double down on their lies is really disturbing. <laughs> that actually reminds me. I saw a really we we gotta, we got to move on here, but I saw a really interesting story this week about a teacher who had figured out a way to uh, to make it easy to spot if people had used generative AI to like write their book reports, and I forget all the details. But essentially, what she did was when she was writing the requirements of like the book report that people would like copy and like input into like a generative AI engine, she would drop in some keywords and and I think she would include the um the keywords in like white font, and she would be like, "You know, make sure you include the word like pirate." and executioner in the format or in, in, in the content that you produce. So she would, she would put like this like key in there and then people would highlight all the text in the requirements page that she handed out or distributed digitally and they would paste it in to whatever generative AI engine they were using. And then when they hit enter, they wouldn't see this text, but the, but the gen AI engine would. And so it would drop these keywords into the report in some obscure way that the person using the engine would never really notice. But then she would do a search for the keywords on her side. And if they popped up, she knew that you had used generative AI to write your book report. And I was like, that's really what's, fascinating. What's the term for that? It is like called putting in a poison pill or something. I mean, people do this in code too, right? Like they put some gibberish in code so you can tell when somebody steals your code. I can't remember the term for it. Um, I want I want to say two more things about this uh, AI pin. One, two. Wanna, you already said like oh, sixteen. Yeah, 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 okay, go ahead. We gotta move on. The price. I want to mention the price: six hundred ninety nine dollars plus twenty four dollars a month for your separate phone line through T Mobile only. And the other thing, <laughs> T Mobile <laughs> only, dude. This thing is D O A. It is vaporware. <laughs> I mean, you got to be kidding me. So, so the other thing I want to say, and and this place, this actually definitely supports your point so they they have that like i said the little laser thing shoots a um a user interface with your which hand, i actually right? thought and did it, look cool yeah like weather and this and that and you clip i've seen videos of people you, you know you move your hand and do this to whatever um but both of these reviewers said it, it, it was very difficult or not not difficult but it, it took them like several days to get to the point where they were comfortable using that interface and these are tech writers right people who so that that is a, a very, very bad situation. I mean, granted, they're tech, tech writers at the Verge. So, <laughs> you know, keep that in mind. <laughs> one yeah, one of them I... said that, like, <laughs> scrolling through a menu and trying to pick something, I did not once ever pick what I tried to pick on the first try. Dude, this is so... just comically bad. I mean, how did they give this to the Verge to review? That's what I wonder. And it also makes me wonder what's going to happen with the rabbit when that thing comes out. You know that thing's going to be just as equally an abomination as this. I think. <laughs> Back to the rabbit. Oh, I think... Uh, it, looks, it looks cool, though. Yeah, it does look cool. I mean, I'll give it that. Well, okay. So, yeah. I mean, the AI pin looks cool, and the packaging looks... Mm -hmm. cool. That's one thing that everybody was saying. Hey, this It looks like a... It looks and feels like a, a really high-quality device. I, and, I think the charging case looks like a cheap plastic knockoff of an AirPods charging case. It's like that cheap, shiny plastic. It's probably made of aluminum, but it doesn't look like it. <laughs> All right. Well, the hardware designers did a good job then, but it's just obviously the software, which arguably... Very important part of the product, well, and, and it's—I I can't remember. They, they believe it said that it was based on like several different AI models that it, they they work with. You know, like I think maybe ChatGPT. I, I don't quote me on that. I can't remember what it was exactly, but several that are in in you know running there. But so, yeah. Anyway, I <laughs> I'll be curious first time I see one. It, 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 I think I described like running into people, like saw somebody on the street, and like 
the person like just stopped and stared at him like <laughs> what have you got on <laughs> he's like i got I just i got out of there because i was uh under N- nda <laughs> All right, well, this will probably be the last time we ever hear her speak of this story, but um, <laughs> that was interesting. All right, let's move on to an all-new What We're Into, the segment where we talk about things that may not fit into the tech topic world, but um, are things that we currently are loving. we got to do this quick. I mean, we've been, we've been live for an hour and 30 minutes here. An hour and 15 minutes, actually. It's too long. This show is only supposed to be 30 minutes. What happened to us? Rabbits. <laughs> well, that uh, is true. That took t- rabbits. That, those wascally <laughs> rabbits took at least 30 minutes of the show, so that's <laughs> on me. Uh, do you guys both have picks? I got something. I don't have to lead yeah, with I it. Got, I got something. Okay. What are you going with, Griffin? You take it away. Okay. Well, lately, what I have been into um, is is an extension of a, of, a, of a passion of mine that's been going on for a long time. Really, the only show that I've been watching recently has been classic Doctor Who. Wow. I've watched the, the new series of Doctor Who like several times over. The next season is coming out in May, and I'm really excited for that. And I've, I've dabbled into classic Doctor Who before. I've watched a few stories from each, from each era of the show. But this is the first time I'm doing like a real all-out beginning-to-end continuous marathon of it. Um, the, the old show is, is very different. Instead of being like, you know kind of like a modern show where it's 45 minutes of a discrete story, almost like Star Trek style. It's, it, was a, it was a weekly serial that went out in like 25-minute segments. And it would be on for seriously almost the entire year. They would, they would write the scripts in advance. They would pre-film whatever they had to like pre-film if they had to do any location shooting. But then they would do like rehearsals in the middle of the week. They would shoot it all pretty much continuously on Friday night. And then it would air the next night on Saturday. Wow. And they did that for almost an entire year for like the first six years of the show. Like season, season three is the longest uh, season of the show ever. And it's 44 episodes long. That is wild. It's part of like a crazy production block. Like some of the details of how they produced this early show were crazy because, um, you know, like a modern show, they, they film it like scene by scene. Like they'll do an entire day and they only film like, five minutes worth of the actual show they would shoot whereas classic doctor who was on such a tight low budget they couldn't afford to do editing so what how do you make a show without editing it they would set up all of the scenes that they would need in a single studio they had three cameras so as they were doing uh finishing up one scene where they would like pan camera to camera live to tape then they would have a different set of actors get ready in a different physical part of the studio. One of the cameramen would run over and then to switch scenes, they would just switch to that camera and keep going. It's like Saturday Night Live. Yeah, basically. And stage they play. Could, That's crazy. They, if they really had to, they could afford like two or three cuts to tape per episode. <laughs> wow. It's like the entire thing would just be recorded live. When, when would this so start? Was it like the 60s? It started 63, out? I think. 1963 to uh, 1989. Okay, so that's classic Doctor Who. Okay, that, that's what I was going to ask you because when you say classic, I was like, what what years does that refer to? And when what comes after 1989? After 1989, it was discontinued. There was a TV movie in 1996, and then the modern show uh, started in 2005. Okay. And it's had a few gaps in its production, but it's been pretty continuous since then. Okay. It's it's all right, you know. Some of the show, some of the show is exactly what you would expect from 1963, but man, some of these episodes are genuinely like very good, and it's 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 kind of hard to believe. Wow, you're making so, me want to go back and I've I've probably only seen one or two parts of episodes of Doctor Who, um, but I didn't realize this had gone back so far, and uh, you're making me want to pick up some of these older episodes and just kind of see what it's all about because I'm guessing those are probably the best episodes. So I have I have two things if you're curious. Um, I have, oh, a, I'm I have curious. another link in the show notes that I'm going to put in. Okay. Basically, a lot of classic Doctor Who is available uh, just as an upload on archive.org where you can just download them because like British broadcasting has a rule where like after 50 years, the episode is just completely into the public domain. So you can just (laughs) watch the, you can find 50 years. Isn't that just called like uh, copyright regulation worldwide. It's like after content that's 20, 30 years old and it still looks great, especially because they're going back and they're um, uprising a lot of older, but popular content and they put it into like 4k and you'll watch something like, um, 
this is a bad example, but like the Hunt for Red October, right? Which I think came out in the nineties, maybe early nineties or something. And it looks like it was made. I mean, that movie could have been made a month ago. It still looks incredible. So like you reach this threshold of quality where anything within this span of time just basically all looks the same, even though it might be 30, 40 years old, even um, this uh, Doctor Who stuff that I'm looking at. This looks like it's a little aged. This is definitely not, not looking current, especially the way this guy's dressed. <laughs> this lady's carrying a boom box on her shoulder. I haven't seen that in a while. All right. Doctor Who, classic Doctor Who. What do you got for us, Lewis? Uh, <laughs> the thing that I've been watching lately, and I am, uh, I'm slightly nervous about how it's going to turn out. I've been watching Constellation. Constellation. Uh, That's on Apple TV, TV Plus, show, right? Right. Now I can't even remember. Uh, Numi Rapace is the 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 main. Okay, character. that's um, why I recognize this. And uh, what's the other guy's name? The guy, the <laughs> another one of the main characters is a guy who was in uh, Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. Oh yeah, um, I, I love that actor, Jonathan I Banks. Remember his name? James uh, Darcy. Yeah, I think it's Jonathan Banks. You're correct, sir. Okay. Uh, it, it, so if, I don't know if you've watched any of this, but it's it's about a a, a woman. Uh, Numi Rapace, who's up on the space station, and there's a catastrophic event, and they're also while this is happening, they're they're trying to do this NASA experiment to like recreate some, you know, new form of matter or something, or create some new form of matter, and and the whole show it just keeps getting weirder. I'm only, I mean, it, I, all the episodes are out already, and I'm mm -hmm. about two thirds of the way through it just keeps getting weirder because like so she comes back from or, or from from the thing but then there's also a, 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 I, sh I shouldn't don't spoil it i shouldn't i shouldn't give any spoilers it all i can say is i don't know where this show is headed and i hope that it's good uh our review we had a we had a post about it a couple of weeks ago talking about you know is is the is the uh finale is it, is it going to be able to like answer all these questions right or is it going to leave us like like a you know the final episode of lost <laughs> you know like oh they just punt on everything right so apparently it didn't answer all the questions but it, it was still a good ending so I, i'm gonna soldier through it's it's a very uh you know it's a, <laughs> it's one of those tv shows that leaves you going hmm, what's going on here what's what what am i uh, it, it's also one of those shows kind of can make you feel like you're you know, not bright enough to watch it, if you know what I mean. <laughs> well, hopefully it delivers. Too many shows make promises and then never deliver on tying everything together. Like, they reveal all these mysteries, but then they, and this happened in Lost, just basically say, ah, don't don't worry about all those mysteries. We got a whole new set of mysteries every season, right? It's like, all oh, that stuff, right. all those cliffhanger stuff, like, don't, don't worry about that. What you need to worry about are these mysteries. And they spend every season conjuring up new mysteries but never actually answering any questions or they get canceled yeah. you know yeah. like right when they're getting good that's exactly what happened with lost it was, it was so many interesting questions posed none of them answered <laughs> yeah um uh, you know a show that was not like that for sure was um i talk about the show all the time in fact i'm rewatching it right now is the leftovers oh man the ending of that show is one of the most satisfying endings of any show that I've ever watched. I gotta put that on my list. Dude, I, you keep mentioning I'm it. Three episodes in. You are. You're what? You're three episodes in. You yeah. said Griffin. Okay, it just keeps getting better. I'm. I'm really gonna be curious. We we need to do a a debrief maybe when you're done watching it, um, because it just it stays dense and nutritious all the way through the end of season three, <laughs> and you get to the end of season three, at least for me. And I was like, dude, they're going to pull Lost on us. They are not going <laughs> to explain anything. And and then something happens in season three. And I was like, holy cow. They tied it all together. And I was like, no way. Oh, my goodness. And, and there's a twist that changes the way you see the entire series, at least for me. And I was like, I can't, this is such great writing. I cannot believe they pulled this together in such a simple and satisfying way. It's one of the best endings of any shows I've ever seen. So I'm going to be curious wow. to hear, I'm going to be curious to hear what you think, Griffin. Um, so, let's see here. Yeah. Speak, 
Speaking of uh, series finales, did you watch uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm ever? I did for a while, but I feel like Curb Your Enthusiasm turned into, um, oh, God, what was the name of that Netflix show with Michael Sarah? Um, Parks and Rec. No. Was it, he in that? I don't no, know. no, no, no. Um, it was the one with Jason Bateman, Michael Sarah. It was a, it was um about that family. That oh right. Owned the banana stand. Help me here, chat. <laughs> I can't believe there's always money in the banana oh, stand. If only you had an uh, AI pin right now, you could ask. Me. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure I know what you're talking about. And, and <laughs> Arrested Development. Arrested Development. Thank you. Right. And what I was trying to say is Arrested Development started off really strong and then it got canceled. And then they brought it back to Netflix, I think. And when it came back, it was uh, it was a skin suit. You know, like it just, <laughs> it looked like it was Arrested Development. But once you dove into it, you're like, no, like all the all the comedy beats are all off. Like it just doesn't feel like it's the same thing anymore. And so, yeah. I thought Curb Your Enthusiasm was okay. I mean, it had its ups and downs. And nothing was, nothing was as funny as the first season because it was so irreverent just, like, mind-blowing yeah you know it's like it was and then it just kind of got weirder and weirder i don't know yeah I, I i enjoyed it enough it had plenty of laughs in the last season but uh i'm sorry i'm kind of sad to see it go oh now. so they did a final season of it i thought it was still going yeah like no it, it, it just just ended like uh last week okay or well, maybe my... even like like this week i don't know it just okay. just recently ended all right so my pitch before we wrap up here We'll see what happens with this. Um, <laughs> I there are certain video game franchises that I love. Um, Borderlands is one of those franchises, and Borderlands One and Borderlands Two, I think, are two of the greatest, finest video games ever made. Now they're making a movie based off of it. We'll see what happens with that. I often tell people that will either resurrect Borderlands into the zeitgeist or put the final nail in the coffin and we'll never hear from it again. And I really don't know which way it's going to go. But there's another fan franchise that I love, a video game franchise. It's called Fallout. One of my favorite game franchises ever. I could spend and have spent countless hours in Fallout. And now Amazon is making a Fallout series. And I haven't watched it yet. Um, I'm probably going to watch it this weekend. Let me see how many episodes. Oh, so they have eight episodes out already. Wow. So they just dropped them all already. That's cool. It's so, included with Amazon Prime. So I'm definitely going to watch it, um, I think. And, um, and I can't believe it took them this long to make into an actual series. So I don't know. I saw some of the casting and I was like, okay, I don't know about this. Uh, it doesn't feel like it's true to the actual show, but there has never been a game that is as well branded or merchandising gold as Fallout. Like they created like this futuristic fifties aesthetic with us. Like I'm showing it on the screen for those of you um, watching. Um, and uh, this little cartoon character guy um, you know, with his wink and his thumbs up is just so iconic the aesthetic of the game is so iconic, like more iconic than I think any other game that's ever been made, in my opinion. Um, and that it, it has such a, like a like a, a life to it, that I think it's going to do really well as a show and possibly as a whole series of movies. Like I think they could create like a whole f a cinema and like show franchise out of this video game because it just makes way too much sense to not make it. But they also might ruin it, which. <laughs> Is definitely love a remix. Bioshock greater than Fallout. Ooh, where's the moderator? Get the moderator in here. <laughs> uh, I have to get him in here for the steel toed boot section to get this guy out of here. Okay, look. That's it. We're puttering out of adjectives and nouns and descriptive phrases. That's it. That's all we have for you guys this week. But the fun never ends when you're into the cult cast because me and Lewis were both on the all new X, duking it out. Of course, you can always just Google D. Griffin Jones, see what pops up. You never know what it's going to be. It could be something on MySpace, perhaps Mastodon, uh, maybe some other long-defunct social media platform that you thought had been taken down, but nope, Griffin's still there, and he's waiting for you. 
Only OnlyFans? <laughs> Don't miss Griffin's <laughs> OnlyFans. Very saucy, but appropriate. Definitely worth the uh, $9.99 a month that he charges. Okay. That's going to be it. That's all the cult cast for have we have for you guys this week. New episodes of the cult cast come out every Thursday night. I want to thank everyone for listening and for hanging out live. And we'll see you guys next time. I particularly like the videos of Griffin dancing. I heard he's going to implement the bongos and loincloth. <laughs> the props from the... <laughs> he drew such a crowd at the eclipse. He's like, maybe I could work this into my OnlyFans. Is that a thing? It probably is. There probably is a bong. I mean, you could say that arguably, uh, 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 there's got to be a bongo influencer out there. Someone, someone who just plays so well. Matthew McConaughey, he's probably about. I mean, you could say he is a bongo influencer. Imagine how many bongos he sold. And hacky sacks, too. All right, everyone. That's it. I've had enough. <laughs>